Good Monday morning here on the show. Welcome back to another great episode. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and I will be playing host once again. And today we have a great uh, guest on the show. He is the leader of the Centrist Party of Canada, Dr. Rana. Dr. Rana, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Chris, for having me at your program. So, Dr. Rana, I've got to I've got to get the first question out of the way for anyone who's ever been on my show, who's ever run for politics. I've got to ask the question, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, it's a very tough question <laughs> because politics was never my thing and it's still not my thing. Uh, you know, I tell people all the time that I'm not a politician. I'm just a concerned citizen like all of us. So uh, I'm a community worker. So I started, I specialize in Parkinson's or I'm a student of Parkinson's, let's say this. Uh, I'm a neurologist. So uh, I started a charity world Parkinson's program. So this charity is very unique and uh, uh, we provide free medications to patients uh, across the world who cannot afford to buy their medications. So while doing this, I had to do many lectures. I had to travel overseas, locally. Mm, I had to do uh, you know, lectures in the retirement homes, nursing homes. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, GTA is very diverse. Uh, you know, it's not like uh, rural uh, Alberta or rural Ontario. So people from uh, all communities are here. And uh, when you are doing lectures for Parkinson's, so you meet all sorts of people, right? So it was like, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, previous conservative government, uh, uh, you know, was um, uh, introducing very divisive, uh, you know, policies, a lot of fear mongering, and I say all the time that, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, like Alberta has always supported or maybe Western Canada has always supported Conservative Party, but Conservative Party has always taken Alberta for granted. So, uh, and I can, I can talk about this later. So at that time, and I was meeting people, people were expressing their concerns. People were, you know, not happy with the policies. So I was thinking, I said, you know, like, like, you know, we are professionals, uh, we are serving people, we have committed our lives, dedicated our lives to uh, help uh, patients uh, uh, with Parkinson's uh, and, and other health uh, issues. Uh, and uh, these people who are in charge of uh, our affairs, our country, um, you know, public purse, you know, and uh, this is how they are, uh, Mm, you know, running the country. So at that time, I started thinking that uh, uh, beside the clinical responsibilities and the community work like for Parkinson's, uh, I, I think that every professional, you know, that's what I believe now, that every professional uh, should um, get involved uh, in, in the political process because when the policies are made, they affect every single person. I can give you an example. Uh, I had some patients with Parkinson's and you know, I, I, I see patients from all different communities and they were from you know, racial minorities. Uh, they were from Indian background. And you know, Parkinson's patients uh, uh, have shaking, you know, tremor, right? That's one of yeah. the important symptoms of Parkinson's. And uh, in uh, uh, Harper conservative times, uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, a uh, lot of scrutiny, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like a lot of, you know, questions to people of color when they were, you know, crossing borders. So these patients, uh, they, you know, when they are uh, put to stress, their shaking gets worse. So they would express this, oh, you know, I was coming in the country after visiting, you know, they were Canadians, like, you know, regular Canadians like you and me. And when they were coming back, they were put to uh, so many questions and such kind of, uh, they felt like they were, they were being harassed, you know? And uh, when they were being harassed, their, their, their shaking would get worse. I, I, I felt very bad. I said, you know, these are patients 
uh, you know, and I started giving them the, you know, letters that, uh, you know, this is my patient, they have tremor. And uh, so if they get uh, exposed to any type of unusual situation or stress, their symptoms get worse, you know. So at that time, I, I started thinking that uh, I think we should not just sit aside uh, and uh, people uh, who are professionals, they should get involved in, in into uh, the political process. So that's where I started thinking and then slowly, uh, and I did join conservative party afterwards. So, I, I, so that's a good jumping off point because I've got to ask, how does a man, a doctor from a conservative background in rural Alberta, because prior to our recording of this interview, we had a pre-interview and uh, Dr. Rana said that he is a rural Albertan stuck in Toronto and I am a Torontonian stuck in Alberta. So we are two bees in a pod in this podcast. So I've got to ask, how does a man from uh, a conservative province become the leader of the centrist party of Canada, because it seems like a jump from right-wing conservative politics to a more centrist view of Canada and Alberta. Uh, see, I don't believe in right and left wing. Uh, I, I don't think we should have this process of, uh, um, you know, leading party and opposition party and opposition uh, job uh, should be to oppose every single policy government brings. And if there is no problem, they have to create a problem and then they have to come up with the solution, um, even if the problem was created by them. So I, I believe that the opposition and the part in government uh, ideally should be one team to serve Canadians, to agree on the policies which are best for nation. There should not be a package deal. I don't believe in package deal. By package deal, I mean that the left-wing parties um, give you a package deal. For example, um, if you um, are against uh, racism, uh, you got to uh, support uh, the um, you know, recreational cannabis, for example. You may be supportive of cannabis. It just, I'm expressing my, just giving you example. Yeah. Or uh, if, uh, if you are uh, fiscally, uh, you are conservative, uh, then uh, you should uh, not have a perception that you like, you know, minorities, or you should be um, not, tolerant of uh, diversity or minorities. You know, this is a package deal. So when you go in one party uh, and if you are, uh, you know, like a, um, if you hold a public office, you have to be aligned with the, pub with, with the party policy, right? Yeah. So uh, these things uh, divide us and uh, they uh, create a sense of tribalism so therefore, I don't uh, believe in right wing or left wing. I believe that uh, uh, both parties or all parties in parliament should uh, uh, develop policies and uh, they should have a very frank and open discussion and whatever is uh, uh, suitable for the people, uh, then uh, you know they, it, it should be a teamwork. So, so that is the reason I, uh, I, I am a centrist, but before centrist, uh, you said, why did I, I was a conservative, you know, person, right? Uh, I, I do, uh, I do support uh, fiscal conservatism. I do support, uh, uh, you know, like um, uh, um, hard work. And uh, so I also wanted to be in conservative party uh, to uh, make an impact uh, that the policies they have uh, should be um, refined or improved. So that was my intention to go into conservative party. So how, how do you become the leader of the centrist party? Actually, before I ask that question, I'm going to ask this question because a lot of people who have just tuned in, and this is about 10 minutes into the show so far, 
what is the centrist party of Canada? Who are they? What do they make? What, what, what do you make up? What are some of your uh, belief systems of the centrist party of Canada? Yeah, so centrist party is a, a new federal party. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it believes in centrism. Uh, it believes in strong principles. <clears throat> it believes in uh, uh, standing uh, for the country. Uh, it is against uh, the division. Uh, this is the, I think, uh, in this time and age, we are going through the worst situation when it comes to unity. Uh, I do understand that there have been two referendums in 1980 and 1995 uh, about the separation of Quebec, but at this time, uh, the situation is even worse. We are more divided now into right wing and left wing, liberal and conservatives, Eastern Canada versus Western Canada, indigenous versus immigrants and so on. So uh, the main theme of centrist party is uh, uniting Canadians and supporting our economy and natural resources. Uh, and uh, Mm, centrist party is like any other party. It's a federal party. It's, uh, it just got registered uh, by Elections Canada in this uh, mm, September 2021 election. And uh, we have uh, a team of uh, uh, executive council. Uh, we have coordinators in different parts of the country. And we have, uh, uh, you know, membership, which is growing. And uh, uh, we believe in... Uh, um, we, we believe in addressing uh, some of the mm, inequalities which has been in our democratic system. So the great thing about my show is because I, I, I have very few questions I come into the interview with because I like to hear what the guest has to say. And you just said something I want to pick up and I want to pick your brain about, and that's unity. You said that we are in a more divided time than we have ever been with left versus right. Uh, with We had Premier Scott Moe at the end of 2021 saying we should be a nation. We have the Maverick Party, which is a Western first pro, uh, party. That is the rise of we need to separate in Western uh, Canada. How do you break through? How do you break through and get Canadians to sit down at a table because there's 38 million unique voices that we have? How do you get them all to sit down at a table and say, okay, guys, we need to just have a frank discussion because no one wants to start that discussion and no one wants to start that unity discussion. And it seems like you want to. How do we do it? And why do you believe you are the person to do that? It is not an easy task. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> yep. The uh, uh, you know, uh, but uh, people who change things are those who take a challenge, who believe in their uh, you know conviction, and uh, you know who 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 have inner strength and moral courage. So if you uh, if we go back and look at uh, uh, look at different um, uh, things which have divided us, I mean, this is not new, uh, you know, like uh, if you look at uh, French versus English is issue from the beginning, uh, when Canada came under uh, control of the British, then um, issue of Acadians, you know, all these things were there, but that's a very remote history. Uh, lately, if you look at it, uh, especially Quebec, uh, uh, Quebec never signed Canadian constitution, right? They refused to sign the Canadian constitution, right? So, and then they always claimed that they are a separate nation and unfortunately uh, we never had a bold leadership to give a very strong message that we cannot have nations within nations. We can be only one united Canadian nation. Yes, because if we start dividing people on basis of language and culture, then I mean, we have many other populations. We have uh, Canadians of uh, uh, Chinese origin, even among the English Canadians, 
uh, we have English Canadians who are, uh, you know, British origin versus uh, Irish origin uh, versus Indians who were colonies of British. They are also British uh, uh, origin, you know, Canadians. Uh, then we can just keep on dividing ourselves based on these identities, right? We are just Canadians. So if you look at attempts, uh, uh, I think there have been uh, uh, various, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, various attempts uh, uh, by Brian Mulroney and uh, other politicians uh, to give uh, uh, Quebec a special status. Uh, so Quebec itself uh, is, I mean, Quebec is also diverse. There are many English Canadians who live in Quebec. And there are many um, other people of other languages. For example, uh, you know, in Quebec City, Montreal, in big cities, uh, there is a big Arabic speaking population. Then we have to give them a status, right? And then if we go by this, then as you mentioned, Scott Moe uh, said that uh, uh, we, you know, just the, you know, uh, you, you know, Saskatchewan could be a nation within a nation. Uh, how long we will keep on dividing ourselves? So we need a very bold leadership. And then uh, Quebec coming up with uh, always, they will send politicians who are separatists. And they would always claim that we are better off, we are independent. They had two referendums. And, in, in, you know, I, I remember in 1995, uh, October, I used to live in Ottawa, right? And uh, it was a very stressful time because we just, I think the referendum was just uh, uh, failed by 1% votes, right? People who are federalists, people like me, who, can never imagine that Canada would break apart. We could not sleep all night. I mean, it was very stressful. What happens if tomorrow Quebec is gone, you know? And then Quebecers, they wanted to keep the Canadian passport and Canadian dollar, but wanted to be a separate nation. I mean, you, 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 know, you, you know, you cannot live in a marriage just on your own terms. You just say, okay, this is, my way or highway, it, it, it does not work. And then they bring this bill 21 uh, where, they where the state uh, claiming of secularism, but imposing its favorite ideology on citizens of Canada, on Canadian soil. I'm not talking about, you know, Canadian citizen living on other soil, but people living in Canadian soil. And our prime minister saying that, oh, you know, I don't want to interfere. I can't do anything. Okay, fine. Thank you. You know, I, you know, he is saying, I don't care what the hell you go through. And then now they want to control what people speak with Bill 96, like, you know, language bill, the only language uh, will be French. So on the other side, you are happy to import oil from other countries and you don't want to use Alberta oil. Uh, you don't want the Energy East pipeline. It was killed by Quebec government, right? Uh, you want to be a nation, whereas other provinces never claim they are a separate nation. Alberta always said it's a province, right? And then uh, the, you know, Alberta exports oil and Quebec imports oil, right? Uh, there's a huge difference in this, right? And then uh, you claim that this is your constitutional right uh, to have uh, equalization payments, right? 13 million, 13 billion, sorry, not million, 13 billion, billion dollars yep. every year. Why should Canada sponsor uh, a nation, separate nation? Why should it be, right? And Alberta has always been contributing and they get zero dollars, right? And all, you know, Quebec, uh, you know, they claim that this is their constitutional rights, but on the other side, they don't want to sign the constitution. What, what is this? This is my way or highway, right? We need a bold leadership to address this. So in this election, especially in this election, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, people were throwing stones on politicians, right? There were politicians who could not run their campaign. And then there were Quebec politicians who were uh, doing protest against vaccination against uh, public health measures, against masks, lockdown, and they were 
themselves not following the protocols, right? So this is the division, right? And then uh, Quebec, uh, I mean, you know, I, I just feel so uh, emotional. And when I, I have known about, about people, students who were born in Quebec, raised in Quebec, they speak French like any Quebecer, right? They were studying the university, went to teacher's college. They wanted to be a teacher. They wanted to be a lawyer, right? And on 16th of June, 2019, they are told you can never be a teacher in Quebec. You can never be a lawyer in Quebec. You can never be a police officer in Quebec because you wear a turban, because you wear a uh, you know cross in your neck or because you, um, you put a bindi, you know, the, the, the dot in, in, in the forehead. So I, I'm going and, I, I'm uh, to interrupt because I've got to ask this question because I, I, I don't want it to become the slam Quebec session of the cross-border interviews, but I got to ask this question. Quebec has been under fire with, like you said, Bill 21, uh, Bill 91, if, Bill 91? 96. 96, sorry. 96. I'm going to ask this question and... The only reason I ask it is because the moderator of the English debates during the last federal election asked Yves Francois Blanchet this question. Well, not this question exactly, but is Quebec a racist province? Does it not like immigrants? Does it not like diversity? Because from the outside looking in, it looks that way. And I know my French listeners are probably going to be sending me some nasty emails after I say that. But <laughs> if you fire someone for their religious beliefs, does not the Charter of Rights and Freedoms not take precedent and say, no, you can't do that because you have the freedom to of religion in this country? So I've got to ask you, as the leader of a, a political party in this country, do you believe Quebec is a racist province? I believe Quebecers themselves, people are not racist, number one. The racism and division is created by politicians. And why by politicians? The politicians have to create an issue. The politicians who have no agenda, empty politician, they have no leadership, <laughs> uh, they have to bring something in the first place, in 2018, why CAQ party is allowed to run their campaign based on the identity issues. We are okay with the gender identity in Quebec, right? We're okay with ethnicities in Quebec, but when it comes to people, uh, faith-based identity, it's not allowed. We have to have some rules and regulations. We, we can't just, you know, run these things. So I think the uh, Quebec government is doing this uh, to, to attract people's attention, to create a divide. Uh, they are doing this fear mongering that, uh, you know, our language is dying, our culture is dying. If we don't control other people's faith, you know, this would be horrible. Our language will be eliminated because they have to create some issue, right? I believe that if you want your culture to prevail, you have to give people more opportunities. We should have Cree language in Quebec. We should have probably, you know, Punjabi in Quebec as a language people could study, maybe Arabic. You know, we should support more English in Quebec so that people feel welcome, right? When people feel welcome, they feel part of a society, right? Then they adopt culture. If you have a um, you know, hostile, you know, approach to someone, of course, they will become even more defensive. I don't think the Quebecers themselves are racist, but this question was presented by politicians or the CA government and party Quebecois in a way that uh, uh, people um, and some people uh, ended up supporting this. And, and since you uh, mentioned about the debate, it was just not a question to, I think, the block leader, but it was a question to all four leaders, right? And our uh, 
um, you know, our prime minister who has been unconditionally supported by minorities, especially in Ontario, right? Um, I mean, this, this, this is very clear, right? Uh, you know, our, you know, our prime minister has always used inclusion, diversity, minorities, right? Uh, standing for rights of people, uh, human rights, uh, you know. Uh, so he said that he found this question offensive. And the question was about Bill 21. You know, uh, I have no expectation from conservative leader that he would condemn anything uh, which is against minorities, uh, uh, you know, like, like their whole platform, uh, you know, traditionally has been anti-minorities. But from NDP leader and liberal leader, uh, I mean, I was very disappointed. They should have openly condemned this. You know, when you care more about votes than rights of people, uh, then you choose your words very carefully, which I don't. I don't agree with them. They should have condemned this. And they should have openly said this, that this law uh, is, is, you know, this law is, you know, discriminatory. And uh, it, it has been two and a half years, right? Since this law was passed. Where was Mr. Trudeau? We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I'm just cautious of time here. So I want to ask one question and then I'm going to start doing the wrap up here uh, with you, Dr. Rana. COVID-19 has reared its ugly head in Canada for the last, well, in the world for the last two years. Uh, March, no, March 13th, 2020, uh, the uh, World Health Organization declared a pandemic and Canada has been grappling with this issue since then. How do you believe or do you believe the Liberal government, the current Canadian government, has been doing a good job handling this pandemic? Uh, I, I believe that we have done much better than our uh, uh, southern friends in handling COVID, especially uh, during the time of uh, Mr. Trump. Um, and I do give this credit to Mr. Trudeau, um, being fair. I think... Uh, Mm, we did uh, uh, we did better. Uh, we did a good job in vaccinations, in um, supporting public health measures, and uh, uh, we had some glitches. Uh, for example, in the beginning, uh, we did uh, not control our borders. Uh, you know, right in the beginning, uh, the previous health minister. Uh, she kept on saying that uh, uh, it's uh, COVID is not a big threat to Canadians. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, you know not a not a not a big issue, more or less to the effect. And uh, I think the border control was late. And then, uh, with respect to uh, procurement of vaccinations, uh, I think the previous procurement uh, minister. Uh, 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 did not do a good job in uh, securing vaccinations. There was a delay in uh, uh, Pfizer shipments at, at, at you know, multiple times. Uh, even then, uh, probably um, because uh, Canadians are, I, I think Canadians are more health conscious. Uh, they are more, um, I would say, you know, educated people. And uh, it's a more civilized society, I think. I think as a whole, uh, we did good. We did allow some misinformation about uh, COVID, that COVID is just a common flu. It does not kill, you know, despite having so many deaths in India. You know, in India, there were hundreds of thousands of deaths related to COVID. And in spite of this, uh, there were, uh, you know, Canadian politicians, especially Quebec politicians, some of Quebec politicians, federal politicians, I, I, I don't name them, but I hope you can understand. Uh, they were driving campaigns against the public health measures. Uh, I did not appreciate this at all. 
so uh, I, I, I would give this credit to liberal government uh, that uh, they did a reasonably, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a reasonably good job uh, during COVID. Uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, I want to turn to the future now because, like I said, we're just cautious of time and uh, we're at the 30 minute mark, but I want to get in these last few questions before we get, wrap up here. Um, Dr. Rana, what does 2022 have in store for Canada? What do you think the biggest issue that Canadians are facing in 2022? Uh, I think the biggest issue uh, Canadians uh, are facing is unity, is one of the issues. Uh, the, um, our unity crisis will uh, uh, get worse. Uh, the Quebec election is coming in October. Uh, the you know, provincial election and the Quebec uh, current government would try to create more uh, divisive issues. Uh, so uh, that would be difficult for uh, some of the Quebecers. Uh, and uh, then our uh, you know, other issues like our economy, uh, the energy and you know, industry in Alberta uh, is suffering. I was there in September, you know, all the big um, oil companies, there has been a lot of misinformation about, uh, uh, about the uh, Canadian natural resources, which unfortunately is uh, uh, supported by all federal parties, almost all major federal parties. Uh, you know now conservatives have also come with a with a carbon tax uh, and um, their carbon tax is even worse than you know what what you know liberals were uh, you know, proposing and uh, then uh, during this cop 26 meeting uh, i was expecting that the canadian leadership uh, would be promoting the what we have done so far uh, it, you know the facts are that uh, uh, the greenhouse gas emission, uh, you know, contribution of Canada is only 1.5 percent, and this 98.5 percent is done by, you know, other nations. Uh, so all this, uh, you know, misinformation is affecting our economy. Uh, so our economy uh, and um, our division, uh, you know, these these are few of the issues uh, which uh, need urgent attention. Uh, what about for the centrist party of Canada? What does 2022 have in store for you guys? Are you expanding? Because you guys, this was your first election, like you said, that you ran in uh, in 2021. What does 2022 have in store for you? So our plan includes um, um, having a very strong membership campaign. So our uh, intentions are to have uh, EDAs in various writings uh, and uh, also uh, uh, we want to, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't have any MPs. Uh, we do want to have uh, some uh, uh, some sessions on these issues, especially uh, we would like to, uh, you know, invite uh, other political parties uh, to um, to you know uh, be together in uh, in in uniting Canadians. Uh, addressing this unity crisis, as well as uh, uh, being very serious uh, towards the uh, towards the economy, uh, especially supporting the you know energy industry uh, you know of Canada. And my last question for you, Dr. Rana, before I let you leave here is. How can people learn more? We've covered a lot in the last 35 minutes of the show, but people probably are going. He has said some good things that I want to learn more about. So how can people reach out and learn more about the Centrist Party, join the Centrist Party if they like what they've heard. Yeah, we have a website. Uh, it's www.centristpartycanada.ca. So our platform um, and uh, where we support our priorities uh, and uh, the way to contact us is on our website. Uh, people who need further information, they can email us through the website as well. Awesome. For those who have listened to the show before or have tuned into the show via YouTube before, you know what I'm about to say. The links to the Centrist Party's website, Twitter, social media handles are all in the show notes. So please check it out because the more you learn, the more you get educated, the better decisions you can make come election time. Um, Dr. Rana, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure to get to know you. Next time you're out here in Calgary, we have a seat ready for you so we can do a live in-person barring any surge of any new variant of COVID-19, knock on wood. But I want to thank you so much for doing this. I'm also thankful to you, Chris, for having me on your show. 
it was a pleasure talking to you and reaching out to Canadians through your channel. Um, so you. for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, my name is Christopher Brown. As always, just remember, keep talking. We will be back tomorrow morning with another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. So for me, have yourself an excellent rest of your Monday, guys. Thank you.